going to talk about now are chemical treatments, and uh, this is more of a conventional approach to bed bugs. Uh, what, would, what do we mean by chemical treatment? Well, this has been around for a long time. Uh, insecticides and such were invented around the time of uh, World War II, but there, there is a history that I'd like to review uh, briefly with you. But it has to do with different formulations, so there's going to be some forms of different products that are out there. And uh, such as dusts and sprays, and there's other strategies that I'll talk about. There's also active ingredients and such, so we'll get into that. But let's get into something very boring to begin with. We'll talk about a definition. Now, the EPA has uh, defined uh, a pesticide, and that's what we're talking about here, pesticides. And it's any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. So it's not necessarily just something that uh, uh, kills, it can repel, it, it, can, it can include disinfectants, antimicrobials, and such like that. All of those are types of pesticides. There are laws and regulations governing these, and there's all kinds of products. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the different products. I don't think you really need to know that much about them, other than that if they are being on your, used on your property, there has to be proper documentation. But certainly your pest management provider those providing the service need to be very, very knowledgeable about what these are. Because uh, as Jay talked about, they need to be applied correctly, safely, and according to their labels. So let's talk a little bit about the history of insecticides and their use against uh, critters such as bed bugs. And uh, people didn't always fear chemistry or chemicals. That's rather a more of a, a, a relatively recent thing in, in human history. Uh, but uh, before the use of insecticides, uh, people moved around a lot. Uh, we tend to take our vermin with us very well, whether it be rats, mice, cockroaches, in this case bed bugs. And uh, bed bugs were thought to evolve from uh, bat bugs and such that have all been talked about because we used to live in caves and cliff dwellings and such. So we, we mingled with these critters and now they've evolved to the point where we have the human bed bug pretty much uh, dedicated to us. So people would, uh, they do the physical removal, you know, things like uh, keeping the place clean, uh, dousing infested items with boiling water. Uh, there's various home remedies, many of which people try today and they shouldn't. But uh, it also involved moving, changing your furniture, going, going to a different residence. And uh, so people were really used to living with vermin a lot more. Uh, when you heard about our grandparents talking about the bed bugs, don't let the bed bugs bite, it wasn't a myth. Uh, up to 50% uh, of households in some parts of the United States had bed bugs. So they were much more common. Uh, then came the advent of some of these chemicals. And, uh, Back then, people, again, they really didn't care too much about the environment or about uh, necessarily people's health as much as they did about getting rid of these pests. So they used materials that were just as toxic to you and I as they were to these little critters. So things like arsenic, mercury, sulfur, uh, a variety of plant extracts. Now, people think going green is great, but some of the most toxic materials on Earth are natural. Arsenic's natural. Uh, and then when you think about uh, boric acid, boric acid is a mineral, very safe material, but it doesn't work on bed bugs. So there's different formulations, different active ingredients. And uh, pyrethrum was a plant extract that is still used today. We still use, they're called pyrethrum type products. They can be used as flushing materials or they sometimes call them insect bombs that are set off to get rid of your cockroaches or whatever. But um, uh, then we got into some very, very toxic materials. That hydrogen cyanide, good stuff. And this would kill, uh, kill anything, but very effective against uh, a wide variety of, of, of critters. Then around World War II, from the advent of nerve warfare agents came this type of chemistry. And these were uh, things such as the DDT, very long lasting, persistent insecticide, but it helped to largely wipe out bed bugs in the United States. Uh, didn't get rid of all of them. We've always had some bed bugs here, but uh, they have grown in recent, uh, recent years, around the last 10 years, because of the increase in international travel, people coming from all parts of the world. Bed bugs are basically in every country. Any place that humans inhabit can have bed bugs. So we're seeing them come in. And uh, these materials, uh, some of which are still used today, 
uh, very toxic to insects, generally getting less toxic to humans, but there are certainly some things that need to be watched out for in terms of some of these pesticides. DDT, very persistent. In fact, it's what's called bioaccumulative. It, it accumulates in the environment, especially fat tissues, so it'd be like in the fish, and then the birds eat the fish, and we, we wound up uh, getting some of that, and some of it very much was politics as well. But uh, uh, times are changing, so today, We've got a big dependence on a group of pesticides called pyrethroids. Pyrethroids are a derivative of that pyrethrum that I talked about. The uh, chrysanthemum type based came, comes from a flower, uh, but it's, very, it's, it's a very toxic uh, insecticide to insects, not so much to you and I, not very good for birds and fish, but as long as we keep it away from the lobster tank, everything will be fine. But these insecticides are different from pyrethrum in that they've been designed to be residual. And what that means is after they're applied, either as a wet spray or a dust or whatever formulation the material is in, it's designed to last for a period of time after it's applied. And what we're seeing, because if you use just a single type of insecticide against an insect, uh, it doesn't really matter what it is. It could be a, an agricultural insect, uh, or it could be uh, something like a bed bug. If you're only using one type of chemistry, what you tend to do is you kill off all the susceptibles. And then what you may be left with are just a few that were just a little hardier. And insects have enzymes in their bodies and they break down poisons that come into their bodies just like we do with a liver. They don't have livers, but they've got similar enzymes. And there's a genetic basis for that. So as you select and get rid of the susceptibles, you're left with the, with the ones that we called more resistant. And there's a genetic basis for that. You do that over and over again, eventually you wind up with a population of insects or whatever target you're going after, it's very difficult to kill. We've seen that all over with all kinds of pests uh, through time. So it's good not to use just one type of chemistry or one approach. That's one of the lessons that we learn. But unfortunately today, there are not a lot of alternatives available for the professional pest control uh, industry. Now you're gonna find online all kinds of products. Most of these are contact products. Some of them are derived from plants, essential oils, but they may be toxic to the insect when they contact the insect, but there will be no residual property. And then many of them don't work at all. Uh, there's a class of insecticide called 25B, which is exempt, and if good efficacy testing, the effectiveness is, does not have to be proven for some of these pesticides. So certainly when we talk about products, insecticides, use a professional pest service, pest management provider. They will know what products can be used, what insecticides may be applied safely and effectively. And it typically takes more than one treatment to do so. Big advantages to chemical treatments, uh, they tend to be less costly, usually. Now, I know I've got some of my hoteliers here that would probably disagree with me because uh, I have to go in and shut down the rooms. There's costs associated with having to close areas, people's time, uh, those kind of things. But in terms of the products themselves, they tend not to be very expensive. And uh, depending on the type of environment that we're applying them in, it can be very cost effective. They tend to be easily available, at least here in the United States. We've got a wide variety of products we can get that are properly labeled. Again, most are the, that pyrethroid chemistry based. And uh, if they're using the right material, there tends to be a lasting effect. Not all insecticides last, but if you pick the right product, put it into a crack or a crevice where the bed bug is likely to reside. Remember, they like to get into those tight cracks and crevices. Thigma tactic, they like to be up against something. So they're not gonna be out in the open. They're gonna be recessed into these cracks and crevices. One way or another, you have to get the product in there. But if you do and you select the right product, uh, it's gonna last for a period of time. They don't last like they used to. In the good old days, DDT, you could get many, many years out of that. There were some barns and such you could apply that and house flies were gone for years. We don't have that anymore. Generally, they last for about 30 days or so before they have to be reapplied. That's a, a good thing in many ways and in other ways, uh, it, can, it can mean more frequent treatments are necessary. Disadvantages. 
Uh, some articles, sensitive items cannot be treated conventionally. When you think about a household or we get into low income housing or assisted living situations, there tends to be a lot of personal belongings. And many of these cannot be treated and should not be treated with insecticides, sensitive areas and such like that. Uh, some pieces of equipment, uh, radios and such, uh, certainly you don't want to be applying chemicals into some of these uh, materials. In, in cases of severe clutter or very difficulty, a whole structure may have to be fumigated. Now, this is where price comes in. Now, a fumigation, uh, you know, people, people talk about different things when it comes to fumigation, but what I'm talking about is a true gas. So that would be something like a sulfuryl fluoride, uh, methyl bromide, which is going away. Uh, we talked about cyanide, they don't use that anymore, but this is a true gas that actually penetrates. You get great penetration, requires tenting the entire structure, uh, requires a pest management company that's licensed, certified, and capable of doing this, and providing it's done correctly, you will eliminate that infestation, but for thousands and thousands of dollars. So that's, that's a very expensive method. Uh, Mohammed's gonna talk about heat. Heat is really not fumigation in this regard, but Mohammed will talk about uh, heat treatment, which is uh, a little different, but, but sort of the same concept in terms of penetration. Now, we do need to protect certain areas. We should not be spraying the bed. We should not be spraying areas where people are residing and places where people are gonna come into contact. Uh, sometimes materials will need to be encased. Uh, Stephen Kells will talk about mattress encasements, so I won't get into that for the sake of time, but certainly when we break off into our workshops for hospitality, that question comes up a lot. Should I or shouldn't I buy encasements for my property? And we can talk about that there. Risk of damage from insecticides, just as many of these other treatments that you're gonna hear about, there's the possibility of, a, of an insecticide reacting uh, with the surface and causing damage. Many of them do, do cause visible residue or visible deposits. It's important not to be spraying everywhere. We're not spraying everywhere. We're spraying where the bed bugs are. So we've got pieces of equipment that are designed to inject by crack and crevices, it's often called, because that's where the insect is. So you're placing the insecticide where the insect is, doing your very best to keep it away from uh, where people might come into contact with it. And you saw some pictures already. Some of these environments get very, very cluttered, uh, sophisticated in terms of how we're gonna treat. Multiple treatments are typically necessary for the, uh, uh, for the insecticide approach. And oftentimes we do hybrid, and I'll talk about what I mean by hybrid treatments here. And time with any of these treatments, it can be time consuming. So that's where the cost can come in is the labor. It's not the products, not the cost of goods. It tends to be the time it takes to treat very, very thoroughly. We've learned through the School of Hard Knocks over the years, test, we basically treated over half a million hotel rooms since we started. And uh, we learned bed bugs are probably one of the most difficult urban insects to eliminate. It requires multiple treatments, thoroughness, and somebody that really knows what they're doing. And uh, if, they, if they don't take the time, if they're, if they're spending uh, too little time making the treatments, they're gonna miss a spot. What's really key is they, they put it in place so when those bed bug eggs hatch, there's something for those nymphs to crawl into, whether it be a dust, such a diatomaceous earth, or it could be a residual insecticide that was put down as a spray. The eggs are very difficult to kill. There's no, they don't have a nervous system like the insects do once they hatch out. So there are some products that are effective against eggs, but not very many. So we have to rely on that residual component for when those eggs hatch. If it's not timed correctly or done correctly, the population will rebound. And there can be risk of complaints today. We have to be very good about educating the people that we are assisting here with the understanding that we want to help them get rid of their bed bugs. We're gonna do it professionally, we're gonna do it safely, but it requires cooperation, a partnership on both ends because they've gotta get the room ready. If we're talking about low income housing or assisted living, there's personal belongings, the closets, all these things have to be prepared for service. And uh, there should be notification, education materials, uh, whether your pest management provider uh, works with you on those because you're gonna have to communicate to your clients or your customers what's happening. And if they're long-term residents, which is in many cases what you're dealing with here, uh, they need to know what's going on. There's a lot of misinformation. Uh, as been already talked about, some people don't like to admit that they have bed bugs. They need to understand it's not their fault. 
and that they're gonna have it taken care of, they're not gonna get evicted, or all these other things that uh, Stephen will talk about later when we talk about uh, those housing situations. So how bed bugs are unique, I think you've heard a lot about this already. Uh, when it comes to insecticides, insecticides can be repellent. They can disperse the insects. Again, thorough treatments are necessary. You wanna make it so that when they disperse, they can't get into some place where they can get uh, refuge or harborage away from the treatment. Uh, if we're talking about a multi-unit dwelling or hotel floor, multiple units will be involved, and I'll, I'll show what I mean by that. Unpredictable, we're still learning about bed bugs. Dr. Stephen Kells and his lab are researching uh, bed bugs. We have one of our uh, associates at Ecolab getting her PhD studying bed bugs. They're still trying to figure out how do they find people. When they're up in those curtains and the pleats, how did they find their way all the way down to that, that host? So uh, we're still learning about them and how they react to insecticides. They're surprisingly hard to kill. They're, they're pretty tough little critters. Harboring behavior, very, very tight cracks and crevices. When they haven't fed for a period of time and they can go for months without feeding, they're not much thicker than a piece of paper. So they can get into very deep recessed harbages and it makes them difficult to access. Uh, mode of feeding, you heard about the piercing sucking mouth part. It limits uh, how well some of our active ingredients and types of formulations will work with insecticides. Dusts, for example, there's very few dusts that we can completely rely on for bed bugs. We don't have any baits yet today for bed bugs other than human bait, natural bait, and that doesn't kill them, that just makes them grow. But there is the quest for can, can there be a, a bed bug bait, but at this time there is not. We talked about resistance to pesticides, the ability of populations to become more and more tolerant or less capable of being killed by insecticides over time. And uh, insects have to come into contact with these insecticides in one way or another. So if it's a residual, typically they're walking on it. If it's a fumigant, they're inhaling it. And, uh, and then again, there's no bait. So in terms of ingesting or ingesting any toxicant, there's, there's none that are used today that do that. So baiting is not an option. And uh, definitely we have to plan, we have to schedule, and uh, you try and schedule as best you can so that the surrounding rooms, as shown here, the adjacent rooms in a cloverleaf for a hotel room, we wanna go to each room side to side and then above and below. About 20% of the time, we are finding bed bugs in an adjacent room to an infested room. Then that becomes an infested room and you expand your, your, your basically your, uh, your examination to the other rooms until you think you've got them surrounded. And then you're gonna treat all of those rooms at least once and the adjacent, or the, excuse me, the infested room will have to be treated multiple times depending on what you're doing. And sometimes we have to go across the hall, there's also common areas, employee locker rooms, okay? How did they get into the restaurant? How did they get into that retail store? Well, they're coming from home somewhere. They could have come in with a patron, but many times they do come in with employees and uh, they'll put a backpack, say, on a, uh, uh, vestibule or, or, you know, basically out in the dining area of a restaurant, and that's how that infestation got there. So we're finding them in some rather surprising places today. Treatment considerations, we talked about adjacent units. Uh, clothing, this is something that would have to be bagged up, and uh, there's different types of things we can do for clothing. If you have a full laundry cycle, it will kill all of the bed bug eggs, uh, all, of the, all of the life stages. You wanna run it through the full cycle, and the dryer temperature is typically between 140 and 160 degrees, so they will be toast in the dryer. Uh, but it's up to you to decide whether those articles get discarded or not based on are they soiled, contaminated. Uh, bed bugs sometimes do leave blood stains because the wounds tend to keep bleeding, and maybe you don't want to keep that bedding around for, for whatever reason. And then um, there's certainly other items, the children's toys, very sensitive materials that you would never, ever consider treating. Uh, there's other methods, and I'll, I'll let Mohammed talk about the, the heat and such for those. And small appliances, uh, many of these have electronics, and of course water conducts electricity, so we can't be spraying into those. Uh, we have to be very careful how we treat these. Oftentimes, if they cannot be treated adequately, they need to be discarded, and discarded carefully so that they're not dropping off bed bugs along the way or spreading the infestations. Bed bugs are excellent hitchhikers. They get into different pieces of equipment, uh, housekeeping carts, wheelchairs, all these different uh, items are capable of moving bed bugs around. 
and you, you're, you're going to see more on clutter. So I know Stephen's going to cover a lot about clutter and, and basically those, those housing situations can vary. You have a very clean apartment, somebody that's very mindful and relatively easy approach, whereas the next door neighbor might actually not be so uh, capable. And then there can be language barriers. We have to make sure we have good communication with our clients, our customers, residents, and uh, also their families. You know, families are involved to make sure that everybody's talking because we want to make sure that they're comfortable with us coming in and making these treatments and making the recommendations, but that they don't feel guilty or clam up such that we're not finding these infestations because they're not coming forward. They're afraid to do so. So preparation is important. Make sure you have all the communication materials. You're going to have to set that up based on the facilities that you deal with, what kind of clientele you have, and make sure that it's professionally done, well communicated, sometimes bilingual. You'll have to have uh, uh, maybe visual pictures worth a thousand words. If you can do things in DVD uh, and uh, make it so that people can actually view something, see what people need to do to get their rooms ready, that's very helpful. And resident does have responsibility. Uh, they need to make sure they're taking care of their clothing. Dry cleaning will work, but the dry cleaners will not take an item of clothing typically if they think it has bed bugs in it, right? They're not going to hang it up within their facility and worry about cross contamination. So dry cleaning, uh, it can work if you do it in house. You have to hit every crack and crevice with those chemicals. Uh, otherwise, if it can be put in a dryer, Again, that dryer can get up to 140, 160 degrees. There's also other heat systems Muhammad's going to talk about. Um, and then uh, make sure every place is accessible. We have to be able to get into every closet. We have to get behind furniture. Some things are very heavy. They need to be moved. Sometimes they're getting under the carpet. And when they get under the carpet, that is real tough. Baseboards are falling apart, right? And they get behind the baseboards, and then they've gone under the carpet. Well, we got to get to them. And there's been situations where we've had to pull back the carpet and sometimes remove it completely in a very extended uh, infestation. Um, oftentimes you'll have to discard items, mattresses and box springs. Uh, you're going to hear about encasements, so we'll talk about those. I don't need to, to spend time on that yet. And then there's going to be the application. Again, this should be done by your pest management provider, not the facilities. Many of these products require a license and certification. And if you work in a commercial establishment, there are several states where it is illegal for you to apply a pesticide, period. You have to have a license to do so. So make sure you understand your local laws, your ordinances. If you are applying products, make sure it's labeled and that you're allowed to do so in that facility. And then there's different forms. There's the sprays. There's the dusts. Uh, many of these are injectable. We need to be putting them into cracks and crevices. We're not broadcasting insecticides again. They're going very precise, targeted treatment, and we have equipment for doing that very well. Uh, different, different, all kinds of applicators. I won't get into, into the details, but they're designed to put the insecticide where it is supposed to go. There are Fumigant-like materials uh, that perhaps will assist with clothing and things where you can put it in a bag with the clothing and, and one, one example material would be Vapona. And then there are fumigants that we've talked about, the, the true gases, very expensive typically and require somebody that's particularly licensed in that capability. So crack and crevice, that's something I've thrown out there a few times. That's the way it should be applied. It allows it to go where the insect is and where the people will not come into contact with it. Void treatment with dusts. Void is a type of crack, providing you're putting it into a crack and crevice, and we want that void, again, to be inaccessible to people. So if we're doing a void treatment with a, with a pesticide product, it should go into a place where people are not going to come into contact. Drop ceilings. Bad idea. You don't want to dust a drop ceiling. People go up in, in there and they do work, but bed bugs get up in the drop ceilings. So you have to know exactly where to apply that material to avoid, uh, say, an engineer going up there and, and getting a face full of dust. So it's important to do it correctly. Um, beneath carpet, we've talked about that. And uh, certainly lots of cracks and crevices. And there's residential settings and there's non-residential settings. The non-residential settings are the easier ones. They don't have the personal belongings. A hotel, for example, that doesn't have long-term residence is an example of that office building. But then when you start getting into apartments, dormitories, oh boy, dormitories, those are fun. And then uh, you're getting into the assisted living and then the uh, Section 8 low-income housing. That's where we're going to spend a little more time today. Furniture, lots of places use used furniture, and they're coming in from warehouses. 
watch out because that's where bed bugs again they're good hitchhikers they can be transferred among used furnishings uh if you do use used furnishings or you know the facility is doing so it should be inspected very carefully before it's brought in some places will even treat them with heat other methods before bringing them into the facility they like to get behind very tiny cracks and crevices, and if the wallpaper is falling apart, uh, if you got your baseboards falling out, uh, woodwork and uh, generating other cracks and crevices, it can make the treatment much more difficult to do. So we have to be very thorough, hitting every crack, every crevice. That's why multiple services are involved. And although we said this is one of the less expensive methods, it can be, uh, it can still, I wouldn't say it's always cheap. And when we say unlearn IPM, I think that means we do need to make more frequent treatments. IPM stands for integrated pest management. That's more of an agricultural term that I wish we never brought into the urban and industrial marketplace because it implies that you have a threshold, that there is an acceptable number of insects. How many bed bugs is acceptable within your facility? Zero, yes, yeah, so IPM really doesn't apply here, but what it means is applying insecticides professionally as you need to, don't overuse them, don't over apply them, make sure you're using the right materials, targeting the right pest, and doing it correctly and safely. And then treatments of small articles can be done with these semi-fumigant uh, type materials like Vapona. This does, is, must, does require a professional applicator. You can't get Vapona uh, really from the standpoint of doing what we need to do for bed bugs. And then deciding whether you're going to discard an item or treat it. And certainly for items that people are going to reside upon, we're going to want to avoid treating those conventionally with insecticides. There are other treatment methods, and uh, I'll let Mohammed talk about those. So fumigation may save some furnishings. Residents don't want to discard. It penetrates very, very well. It requires tenting of a structure, and uh, it's basically a true gas. These gases are regulated by Homeland Security, so it's a type of business that uh, Jay and I were just talking. It's a type of business that some pest control companies are just getting out of because it's, it's too risky from that standpoint. And uh, secure conditions only, licensed and certified, somebody that knows what they're doing and has, and has got the credentials to do so. Uh, it's got safety considerations. These fumigants are just as toxic to you and I as they are the insect. They will kill anything, including plants. So you really need to, and they're also not compatible with some materials. Some materials like foam and, and such foam uh, insulation they may not be compatible with. Uh, no residual protection. Once that gas has been off-gassed, it's gone, which is good. You don't want it, if it's, if it's vacated, they do it properly, there'll be no residue. Uh, but then there's nothing there, so bed bugs can certainly be uh, reintroduced, and that does happen. And then you heard about the follow-up inspections. Uh, there may be canine treatments, the use of monitors to see how well your program is working, and then occasional maybe proactive inspections. But if you have uh, a situation where you've got people going into the rooms to help uh, with cleaning and such on a regular basis, they're another set of eyes. So they can help you look, and, and certainly maybe your facility has a logbook or something where you're communicating uh, who's seeing bed bugs or suspect bed bugs so you can keep up on it. So you heard Jay talk about monitoring. Well, there will be multiple treatments involved. It's very difficult to eliminate bed bugs conventionally with insecticides with a single treatment. You might be able to do it, but you're being lucky. And uh, when are you done? Well, hopefully, you know, we've got, we've got something proactive in place. The most proactive thing we can do is education. Keeping your staff, your employees, and uh, basically up to speed on what bed bugs are and what it is that they need to do about them, and then how you're dealing with your guests, your residents, your customers. Education is the most proactive thing we do, can do. There's nothing you can do to stop bed bugs from coming into a facility. We're coming up maybe with some chemical detection techniques. Canines can maybe smell it on the luggage, but that's against the law to, <laughs> to start going through people's luggage and such, such like that. So they're going to bring it in, and uh, you have to deal with it after that on a reactionary basis. Then there's combination treatments. For example, you could do both insecticide and heat type treatments. Mohammed's going to cover off on heat uh, in detail. And in fact, when we do heat insecticide treatments, oftentimes insecticides are needed because bed bugs could move or you use them together to get a much better result. So um, there's steam, and Mohammed's going to cover off on these, so there's no reason that I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to take the time because he will cover off on, there's more than one way to kill a bed bug, 
And uh, when we start talking about these sensitive items that we don't want to treat with insecticides for very good reasons, that's where these other treatments will come in. It will also help to save furniture and save some of the costs there.